Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Deborah Emmons and and I'm the executive director of Historic Cherry Hill. It's such a pleasure to be here at the New York State Museum and uh, for Cherry Hill to be able to bring you this lecture, Agency and Identity, Cherry Hill's would-be sisters. This lecture is part of a series called Glimpses of the Gilded Age. And if you enjoy the lecture this evening, I encourage you to visit our website or pick up some literature. There are a few events remaining uh, in this series, including Gilded Age tours of the historic house this Saturday and next, um, as well as a costume tour and um, another lecture at Cherry Hill on music in the Gilded Age with a, a holiday inspired mini performance and that's with Dr. Chris Brellix. So a lot going on and a lot to look forward to coming up over the next few weeks. The Gilded Age has been our focus throughout our open season this year. And lest you think we are simply riding the wave of the HBO series, we are doing that a little bit. Um, in truth, this started for us more than two years ago when we undertook a project called Historical African American Experiences at Cherry Hill, funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, and in that project, we identified and digitized every item that we could find in our collections related to African American experiences at Cherry Hill during our period of interpretation from the period of enslavement on into the 19th and 20th centuries. And in the process of undertaking this project, what we discovered was that there were some extraordinarily rich stories set in the second half of the 19th century that had never been adequately or equitably studied or interpreted that alongside the story of Kitty Putman, later Catherine Rankin, and her ancestry and her plight, there were the stories of Minnie Knapp and her siblings, four African-American children probably descended from a woman who was enslaved at Cherry Hill and raised with pseudo family status as wards and servants at Cherry Hill and other Van Rensselaer households. The NEH project marked the beginning of a new interpretive focus at Cherry Hill that this lecture is a part of. Um, I'd like to thank those who have contributed to our work and made this lecture possible. Um, our, our supporters, the Hudson River Valley National Heritage Area and Humanities New York um, for supporting this lecture. Uh, of course, our partner, the New York State Museum for partnering with us um, on it. Uh, I'd also like to thank those who have contributed to our research, including Dr. Robin Campbell, former curator at the Bureau of Historic Sites and past president of the Costume Society of America, and Dr. Shannon Drucker, uh, assistant professor of English and affiliate faculty of women's gender and sexuality studies at Siena College. Uh, and both of them helped us to shape this lecture. I'd also like to thank Brittany Bells, costumer and costume historian whose incredible recreation of Minnie Knapp's dress you will see today. I'd like to thank Connie Frisbee-Hood, who um, may know the Cherry Hill costume collection better than anyone on the planet. <laughs> um, and she is always ready to answer questions or dress a mannequin, whatever is needed, and we are very grateful for that. And I'd also like to thank and acknowledge Dr. Corey Graves of the University at Albany, who's been an ongoing consultant with us since we first launched our historical African-American experiences at Cherry Hill Project. I'd also like to thank Shauna. <laughs> Shauna Riley, Cherry Hill's Director of Education, for the incredible amount of research and preparation that she has put into this presentation, which I am personally so looking forward to. Um, and without further ado, please welcome Shauna Riley. Thank you for having me. Um, so I don't need to thank anyone up there. Um, Deborah's already taken care of that. Although we'll thank Jocelyn. So yes, 
We'll thank you after you've done the hard work of standing in that, in that garb and sitting, actually. <laughs> that doesn't look easy either. Um, so we'll begin the presentation as soon as I figure out how to... Okay, um, so the two people we'll be talking about today are Catherine Bogart Putman, Kitty Rankin, uh, and Harriet Mariah Elmendorf, Minnie Knapp. For the presentation, for the purposes of it, I will be referring to them as Kitty and Minnie um, because changing their names halfway through when Catherine starts using the name Catherine would be confusing. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons why they are great, um, their subjects to talk about together is because they really both came of age at the same time in the Gilded Age. And they came of age at Cherry Hill. And just a little blurb about Cherry Hill. Um, we have a very large collection, intact collection there. It's built in 1787 for Philip and Mariah Van Rensselaer. Um, we have very mundane items like a toothbrush. And then we have very rare items like maps and tapestries and, and the like. And one of the things that I focused a lot on this project is um, material culture, of course, but also our huge collection of letters and other documents. Now, these two women had a common life-shaping experience. They both came to Cherry Hill when they were around the same age. Here's an image of Minnie uh, in 1855. She's about three or four years old. And an image of Kitty Putman. She's about three years old when she comes to Cherry Hill. We'll talk about why they come in a moment. Um, but I wanted to really emphasize the fact that this is a very complicated story. It wasn't easy to determine, okay, is Minnie a child? Is she a part of the family? Is she a servant? She's a little bit of, of all of those things. And we'll unwrap why that is um, as we go through the material culture. Um, and Kitty Putman is the person who eventually inherits Cherry Hill. Um, and if you've been to Cherry Hill, we've been telling her story for quite a bit of time now. The story actually begins much earlier than when they come to Cherry Hill. Um, we have the patroonship, the, which um, Philip Van Rensselaer, who had historic Cherry Hill built in 1787, he's a benefactor of, of course, because he's a descendant of Killian Van Rensselaer, the first patroon. He was not the patroon at the time. Um, he was never the patroon, but he is benefiting from the social status. He's benefiting from the wealth. And there's also this... As the decades and the time goes on, his descendants are benefiting from the refinement that they've been raised with. They have this stature in society because of the way that they've been raised and because of the leisure time that they have in order to, to have that um, presentation. Now, we're going to talk about uh, Minnie Knapp's ancestry as well. And this dates back to the 18th century and early 19th century. Um, this was not a new discovery, but this is something that we really unpacked and really wanted to think about. We believe that Minnie was a descendant of a woman named Dean who was enslaved by Solomon Van Rensselaer. Solomon Van Rensselaer marries into the Cherry Hill family. He's also a cousin. Uh, he marries into the second generation. He and his wife, Ariet, own um, Mount Hope Farm, which is just down the street from Cherry Hill, and then eventually they do take over. And there's evidence to show that they are, the two households, Cherry Hill and Mount Hope, are pretty intertwined. So we do believe that Dean, even though she was enslaved by Solomon Van Rensselaer, that she was also working at Cherry Hill. Um, we also believe that Dean is Dinah Jackson. So if anyone has uh, attended Cherry Hill's murder tours or read about the murder at Cherry Hill, we believe that these two people were one and the same. There are a lot of different spellings of Dean and Diane and... Dina and Dinah, and the dates line up for these two women to be the right, to be the same person. Um, Dinah Jackson was a cook at Cherry Hill. She was there um, as a 50-year-old uh, at the time of the murder. We know this from the confession. And then she, uh, because emancipation is on July 4th of 1827, and the murder trial happens at the end of July, she's able to testify. So we actually have her, her spoken words recorded which is a, a very rare thing. Um, if we follow Dean's family, we also have in the collection an, a term of service. 
So this is uh, an indenture for children who are born after 1799 whose mothers are enslaved. And Diane, we believe, is the daughter of Dean. And she and her infant child are their, um, their labor. You know, this is kind of in this phase of pseudo um, slavery, right? You know, what's, it's a name, really, that's changed. But their labor is being transferred from Solomon Van Rensselaer to Robert Sanders Van Rensselaer in 1825. And we believe that the child is Jane Jackson Knapp, who was Minnie Knapp's mother. So that's the connection in the ancestry here. Um, and Robert Sanders Van Rensselaer was uh, Kitty's great-grandfather. So this is her mother, Harriet Mariah Hattie By Van Rensselaer Putman. Uh, she is the grandson or granddaughter of Robert Sanders Van Rensselaer. And so their families are actually much more connected than we would have initially thought. They are through uh, enslavement. Now, we, you might ask, did we just line up the dates? We had some family proof here. Uh, so the Van Rensselaer family members at Cherry Hill uh, kept lots of genealogical records. They were constantly writing down their genealogy and that of everyone else. And so they actually recorded the genealogy of the Knapp children. And they connect Jane, their mother, to Diana, or Diane, and to Dean. So the family believed that she was a descendant of Dean. We'll get into some of the other details that are on that, that note in a moment. Um, and then we have another family recording. This time it's Emily Rankin, who is Kitty Rankin's daughter. She's recording these family memories in the 1930s. It's a terrible, uh, you know, it's like a scrap of a scrap of paper, but it says servants, Mom Dean Cook, Hattie Van Rensselaer Gould, um, who grew up in the household at the same time as Kitty. Um, her earliest recollection is her daughter Diana, her daughter Jane, who married a half Indian named Knapp. They believe that the Knapp children were um, part Native American. And then they say she died leaving four children who were raised by members of the family. So when we consulted historians and other academ academics, their um, opinion was that if the family members believed that they were connected, then they likely were. And now this note, these two notes also reveal the next tragedy is that uh, in childbirth, and I'll go back, in childbirth, uh, Jane Jackson Knapp dies uh, have, while she's having her fifth child. So her four children, including Minnie, uh, are sent up to different Van Rensselaer households. They're literally scooped up. They go down and get them and bring them to their households. Now again, this is a very common story in the 19th century. Um, Hattie By, who was Kitty's mother, also dies when she is young. And here's a diary entry from Harriet Mariah Elmendorf of Cherry Hill, who uh, brought in both of the children. And she talks about, um, she died of convulsi, assuming she was having convulsions. And her dying wish was that uh, her cousin, also named Harriet Mariah, so we'll call her Hat, uh, would raise Kitty. Now, these two, young girls are not, um, they're what we would call a half orphan. Um, and the reason that they are only partially orphaned is because they both had living fathers. We have James Knapp, who um, was married to Jane Jackson Knapp in Hudson, New York. And we have Alonzo Putman, Dr. Alonzo Putman, who was married to Hattie By, And they lived in Glen, New York in Montgomery County. Now, the two fathers, um, as you can see, live into the Gilded Age, um, and they don't disappear from their lives. Uh, we'll find out a little bit later about how they continue to be a part of it, but for all intents and purposes, they do not have any role in raising their children. And this is also a common story. We know from um, records at the Albany Orphan Asylum that Judith Thelberger um, very skillfully assembled is that uh, this is a common thing. And families had to grapple with this all the time. If you're a father, you have children, the mother passes away. How are you going to care for these children? A lot of men remarried right away, and then they've solved that issue. 
but a lot of men struggled with who's going to raise this child. And in this person's case, William Cohen um, sent his son to the Albany Orphan Asylum um, until he could take him back home. Now, this brings us to this idea of childhood. You have all of this, this death, you have tragedies that are not all that uncommon. You have children being displaced from families, but it's also a time of idyllic childhood and motherhood. This is a piece of sheet music that actually belonged to Minnie's brother, James. Um, he had hundreds of sheets of music, and that's for another conversation. But uh, I thought that this one perfectly uh, demonstrated what's going on. The mother is home with the children, she's nurturing them, and the father is away. So when Minnie first comes to Cherry Hill, she comes with her sister Jane, who is the girl in the middle. So Minnie's all the way on the left, Jane's in the middle, and then the little girl on the right is Margaret Carroll. She's the daughter of a woman who worked in, at Cherry Hill uh, who was widowed. She had four daughters. She wasn't there for very long. Later records show that she and her daughters were all um, admitted into an asylum. But the two girls, uh, the two Knapp daughters, uh, are both at Cherry Hill in December of 1854. And then, unfortunately, Jane is sent away in not long after, a few months later. Um, and we have a pretty good record of the different siblings based on letters, especially in the collection of James Knapp. So we have William James Knapp all the way on the left, who's the oldest. He is raised in the household of Richard Van Rensselaer, who lived on 112 State Street. So he and Minnie have a relationship. We know that he visited her every Sunday. And he has a relationship with the Cherry Hill family, which we'll be exploring more in the future. Uh, his collection, our material culture collection on James is very rich. We also have Jane Amelia Knapp. So she grows up um, in the household of a woman who was married into the Van Rensselaer family and in Syracuse. Um, but we know from letters that she had what she described as a disgrace and she leaves as a teenager. Um, she remarries, she marries, she lives in Elmira and we have a record of her children. Unfortunately, we cannot find a record of any descendants of her children. Um, and then we have Richard H. Knapp. He later changed his middle name to Van Rensselaer. We see in late um, registries that he actually changed his middle name. He was sent to a household, that, another Van Rensselaer family household of Cornelia Thumb in Philadelphia. And he's raised there. We don't have any images of him, so I thought I'd put uh, James's uh, uh, practicing writing his address. Now, we have all these siblings. Um, James is the only one who has a relationship with Minnie. Minnie does not travel much, especially without the family. She wouldn't have traveled at all. And so she does not have a relationship with Jane and Richard. And we'll get more into why, but the essential reason and one of the challenges of this project is that Minnie did not read or write. And so we're limited on interpreting her um, we had to look, we had to do a lot more research and read between a lot of lines. All right, other people in the house are Hattie. There's another Harriet Mariah. So we'll call her Hattie. That's Hat's daughter and Hat's husband, Peter Elmendorf. The three of them are what make up the family members of the Cherry Hill household when Kitty and Minnie both come in. Um, it appears that Peter Elmendorf was pretty doting on Kitty. She called him Uncle Doctor. And here's a letter that she writes to him when uh, he and Hat are traveling. She is about 10 years old. And you can see from the letter, she's a little put out that they aren't home with her and they haven't been writing to her. So um, she even says, I do not think I will write again until you and Aunt Hat write to me. And in the end, she says, I would like you and Uncle Doctor to write to me so I can get it on my birthday. So she's being raised as a child and acting as a child would. Uh, we also see that there is some indulgence with Minnie and Jane. And in one of the letters that Peter writes to Hattie when she's away at school, he says that Minnie is carrying on with me that I cannot write. She's jumping on my back and joggling me. She says she's making guest preparations in her mind for you coming home. Because Hattie's away, she's in Ohio. She sings over every day what she's going to do and give Hattie when she comes home. So this is implying a closeness. And there are lots of letters from this time period when Kitty is very young, really um, demonstrating that she is being given a childhood of sorts. 
We have some students from our teen program joining us. They just had a tour of the museum. So I'll let them walk in as I'm doing this. All right, and so now we have Aunt Hat, um, who is really, she's the matriarch of the household and she's the person raising these children. And Kitty calls her Aunt Hat. Um, Minnie calls her Ma. And it's not clear if, if she calls her Ma right from the get-go, but pretty early on she is referring to her as Hattie refers to her Ma. And you can see how close and bonded she is to Hat even from the very beginning. They're traveling, Peter and Hat are traveling to Scotia, which was a big endeavor from Albany at the time. And they get stuck, stuck in a snowstorm. Peter has to lead the horse. And he writes that we have had a hard time getting home. Minnie cried when she saw your mom. And you can just imagine they come in at 11 o'clock at night and this little girl bursts into tears. We also see this um, play out throughout Minnie's life. So we have this card from 1883. She's an adult and it's addressed Ma with Minnie's best love and many wishes for a happy Christmas and a great many of them. This is in Hattie's handwriting, um, but it shows that this is Minnie's intention. Another image that shows that Minnie was doted on as a child, um, here's a daguerreotype of her and the pet dog Lily, who features in the letters too, uh, from 1855, shortly after Jane left. She's dressed well, she um, is featured with the dog in the same way that Hattie is in this other daguerreotype, which is not in good shape, um, which is why the image is so poor. But she is being treated as a child of the house. But there is a blurry intimacy. So we have these two letters um, that talk about the two, the two girls. And I'm comparing them mainly because it, it's in regards to their toys. And I'll talk a little bit more about that after the slide. But in this one, it says, Kitty talks almost every day of Aunt Hat to all Cherry Hill. She says, if you will only come, you shall stay and might sleep in Kitty's nice bed. She calls her favorite doll Minnie. And this is written by Hattie By before Kitty goes to live at Cherry Hill, before her mother has died. You see that she has visited Cherry Hill in 1860, and she has a doll, and she's calling it Minnie. So she has formed a relationship. And then in the letter on the right, Peter Almendorf, again, is writing to his daughter Hattie while she's away. And he says, Minnie has a little doll, and she calls it Miss Hattie. And your ma kisses it and calls it Miss Hattie, too. And later in the letter, it says, you know, she's had to kiss it several, you know, she keeps having to kiss this doll. So again, they're indulging this child. Um, but then, also in the letter, it says, Minnie and Janie are talking about you all the while. They had a little dispute the other day. Minnie said she was going to be Miss Hattie's waiting maid, and Janie said she should not, as she was going to be Miss Hattie's waiting maid. And so they keep talking about you every day. This is before Hattie, or before... Um, Jade has been sent to Syracuse, but this shows that early on these children are being raised with the intention you will be a servant in this household. So it's a, it's a blurry distinction. Now we have dolls in the collection and there are quite a few porcelain dolls and dolls of different eras, like the one on the right. This is probably the, the fanciest. I'm gonna, I'm looking at Deborah wondering if she thinks that. Um, but we have this, we also have this doll on the left. And we don't know which doll Kitty or Minnie would have had. It wouldn't have been uncommon for children to have dolls, you know, for a white child to have a black doll or for a black child to have a white doll. But one of the things that I do want to point out is that this is a time when there are a lot of dolls um, featuring African Americans in a very unflattering way. And they're created to be that way. And this is not one of those dolls. This doll is beautiful. It was made with care. They're both um, from Germany. And the doll on the left is, is of a good quality. And doing research on dolls, you can really get into a rabbit hole, I'll tell you if you're interested in doing some research on dolls. But um, there's a discussion about what do dolls represent. And in many instances, a child might be given a doll um, to role play or to um, to put people in their place. And that's, and especially in a household um, where a child is being raised as a servant or in the South when, where people were enslaved, African-American children were sometimes given dolls that were not flattering. And it's so it's important to show what are what is this doll representing to young Minnie. Now, the other interesting thing that the doll shows us, the doll is wearing, Kitty's doll is wearing jade. 
uh, which is uh, jewelry from, that shows that someone is mourning. And Kitty, in her young pictures, is also wearing jade. You can see her jade necklace. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, just in the idea that Kitty is calling uh, Aunt Hat, who's raised her since she was three years old, she always calls her Aunt Hat. She never refers to her as Ma or Mother. She can't replace her mother in the family. The whole family has had this loss of losing Hattie by. If we compare that to Minnie's experience, she starts calling Harriet Mariah Ma. There doesn't seem to be um, an attempt to allow the children to mourn. And even in letters when Jane has left, you know, no longer are they mentioning Jane in letters, and we know that she's gone to Syracuse, Minnie is actually sick for a while after that. And there's no reference to Minnie might be missing her sister, or Minnie might be homesick. Um, and so it, it begs the question, are servants allowed to mourn in the same way that a family member would be allowed to mourn? And then I found this letter, and it's talking about Carlo, who was a pet, who has died. And there's this long description of how the other animals in the house are mourning, and then the children in the house, and Ma, who is Harriet Mariah Hat, uh, they're all wearing mourning clothing for this animal who's passed away. And so you think about it, you know, this is obviously play in, in some ways, but is, was it deemed impractical? to allow a child to be, to be mourning a mother who they will not see again. Now, oh, one thing I do want to point out in this picture is, bless you, talking about jewelry, we asked the question, are they wearing, um, are they wearing jet in this image? And you can see that some of the jewelry actually is painted red. And the implication here is that they're actually probably either wearing coral or the idea is that the coral is being put on them afterwards and you know, their jewelry is their jewelry. And the idea is that coral has protective qualities and this is dates back to the Roman era. So we have this classical um, painting of a child wearing a coral necklace. It was used for teething, but it's also intended to protect a child. And if you think about it in the picture of Minnie with Lily, the dog, She's also wearing coral. You can't see it as well in this image because it's so hyper blown up, but it's, there's a red painting around her neck and around her sleeves. So they're children who are being protected, but not necessarily being allowed to, to mourn. Now, as the children come of age, uh, Minnie and Kitty, they're referred to in different ways. So we looked at census records. This census record from 1865 shows Kitty, Catherine B. Putman. She's being marked as an adopted child. And then we have Minnie Elmendorf. They don't have her last name nap on there. They have Minnie Elmendorf, um, and she's a servant. She actually wouldn't be 14 in 1865. They got that date wrong. Uh, she'd be about 11. Um, but if you look at a later census record from 1875, she's listed as Minnie Knapp, and she's 14. And she is clearly a servant. And at this time, we have another servant arriving in the house, which offers us some context to kind of unwrap this, this issue of child labor. So we have Mary Burl, uh, who came to Cherry Hill in 1873, 1874, at the age of 11. There's an image of her from 1880. And she came from Washington, DC. She was born in 1863, and she's placed at Cherry Hill by Eliza Heacock, who's the matron of the Home for Destitute Colored Women and Children in Washington, D.C., which has a fascinating history if you're ever interested in looking into that. Um, it's basically a home that was established when you have um, refugees coming from the South during the Civil War and after the Emancipation Proclamation. So she's placed in this home. We looked into her history and we found that she was actually a child in another home in Washington, D.C. before she came, um, a Reverend Jacob Ross. Jacob Ross was an African-American man who had um, bought his freedom and that of his wife and child previous to having the house in Washington, D.C. And when Mary is listed there, she's listed as a boarder. She's five years old. She has no um, adult with her, as far as we can tell. Um, she's also listed as um, M in this census record. So if you look again, you might look at Mary and think, well, what does this have to do with Minnie? She's actually, they believe she was African-American or actually or had African-American heritage. And that gives us some context too, because we want to think about whether or not she, Minnie is being raised the way she is being raised, what connection there is to her race and what connection there is to her being 
a child of, you know, of working class, which was, there were many children in that position. Um, we have this letter from um, Eliza Heacock where she is inquiring about Mary and she says, as she is growing in years and in usefulness, it will be pleasant to hear from her as well. And that really is important distinction because children are coming into these households. Obviously, um, if they are orphaned, they need a place to live. A household would be preferable to an asylum. Um, but they're serving a purpose in these households. And the idea is that they are meant to be, to be helpful in the households to do work. Looking into this history in Albany, this is not an uncommon thing. So child indentures at the Shaker site, um, like Mary Ann Bowie on the left, and through the Albany Orphan Asylum's records, um, there's a record for Joanna Fisher, show that lots of children were placed in homes uh, to work. And if you look at the child indenture on the left, you can see these children were guaranteed certain rights, and they were also going to have certain opportunities. They'll train to do something. In one case, um, a child is going to learn to be a seamstress. Uh, if they don't like this situation, they can leave if their parents can, you know, are willing to come get them. Um, this isn't what's happening at Cherry Hill. We have no record of there being any indentures. So the children are there rather informally. Even Mary Burrell, we have not found a record of an indenture, and they actually do apply for her guardianship uh, when she's a teenager. Now, this all tells us something about what life is like at this time, but I want to make a distinction too in the idea that Cherry Hill, who are their peers at Cherry Hill? Cherry Hill um, never really, <laughs> trying to think of a way to say this uh, and that doesn't sound flippant. So really they peak with Philip and Mariah Van Rensler. They do not go on to be more and more wealthy with wealth building. This is a story of a family that suffers decline throughout the 1800s. They are not economically um, opportunistic. They're not really uh, changing with the times. Their wealth is based on agrarianism, which is you know, becoming obsolete as you go into the, 20th, or into the 19th century, especially because the city is encroaching on the land and they are unable to keep it. So by the time we get to the Elmendorf period, they're down to about 25 acres of land. It's not a large farm anymore. Um, the other thing that I, I do want to mention is that you do not see other households, uh, you don't see the Livingstons, you don't see the Jays, you don't see these wealthy, powerful families having children working in their house. When you look at the census records, they have adults, they have a huge staff, you know, more like a dozen. They have people with differentiated roles. Most of these people are either native born or they are um, recent immigrants. And you don't see even a lot of African-Americans working in these households. So what the, the Elmendorf seem to be doing at Cherry Hill is they're, they're taking in children. Um, there's certainly some altru altruism in that, but it's also an opportunistic situation. And we'll see with Minnie that there is, um, Minnie does end up being a special case. This is an image of Cherry Hill in the Gilded Age. If you've seen anything we've put in our marketing, you have seen this image. Uh, if you see Minnie is in the middle uh, next to the urns, the women, uh, Hat, Catherine, and Hattie are up on the porch. And then we have uh, Mary Burl is down by the baby and Hattie's husband is there. All right, so we have catapulted ourselves into the 1880s because this is the moment where Cherry Hill really has, uh, there are big changes afoot. Um, we, through our recent research and our projects, we've been able to digitize our space, which allows us to show you the spaces where servants have lived. I can tell you that that's not a good staircase to bring people up. It probably would not pass fire code, so we wouldn't take you up there, but you can explore it virtually. The other issue that we've had in interpreting is that these spaces where people slept and lived, no one was sleeping or living there in 1963 when the house became a museum. So the family in later years used it for storage and the museum staff used it for storage or for offices, which has made interpreting Minnie's room in particular difficult because there, there have been things in there that have been there for a very long time. But you do get an idea for what the stairwell is like. Um, she and Mary shared a room in the garret. Contrast that to Kitty's bedroom. This is the bedroom that she came into Cherry Hill when she was a three-year-old. 
I love walking into the space and saying, could you imagine being a three-year-old and being told this is your room? Um, in this room, there are items that she also uh, connect her to her ancestry. So uh, next to the bed, there's a commode chair that belonged to Philip Van Rensselaer. And you'll see that actually follows her in her bedrooms through the house. That's an important piece to her. And you start to see Kitty start to form her identity based on her connection to the Van Rensselaers and to Cherry Hill. We also see in looking at Kitty's material culture that she has quite a bit of leisure time. We have these cartoons or doodles that she made. Uh, the postman is coming in the left picture, and I imagine that might be Minnie standing up by the door opening it, and maybe Kitty running down with all their pets to greet him, uh, and the excitement that that would bring when you know, a letter carrier comes to you. And on the right, the Ole Cooks, it's Ole Cook Day, they made their Dutch donuts on New Year's Day, and someone dropped them on the stairs. And so that's what that cartoon is. Um, we also have a poem that Kitty wrote, and she's writing this actually as part of her lessons. It's all about her home and how beautiful it is, and you know, watching the seasons change. And again, you don't get to sit and watch the seasons change unless you have time to do it and to notice what stage the flowers are and what birds are coming into the yard. Um, Kitty was educated. She went to the, um, the normal school in Albany for a year. So she was educated by people who are training to be teachers. Um, but most of her education was actually at home. And she was taught by two people. Uh, Catherine Bonney, if anyone's familiar with Cherry Hill history, Catherine Bonney was a missionary who uh, went to China. She came back to Cherry Hill on and off. She grew up at Cherry Hill, of course. Um, she wrote Legacy of Historical Gleanings. Uh, she ran a girls' school in China. She uh, was the president of a college in Hickory, North Carolina. She would have been a proper person to be giving Kitty an education. This uh, image here is actually Kitty's recording of what she's learning uh, at school because she does go for one year at Miss Graham School for Young Ladies. It's on Fifth Avenue in New York City. It would have been a bit of a splurge for her to have gone there, but um, it's important to the family. And you can see Hattie is the person who takes over after Catherine Bonney leaves. Hattie is her older cousin. Hattie is impressing upon her what's important. Excel in everything, but of course music. And up here we have a description of her lessons. This is not someone who is expected to go out and hold a job. This is someone who's expected to be a young woman in society, to be able to run a household, be, to be able to get married, to be able to raise children. Now, let's talk more about that home education. We have some items up here. We have a quote from Catherine Bonney. She says, I have school hours morning and afternoon each day in my room for Kitty, Emma, who is her daughter, um, who she adopted in China, and Minnie. They all seem very happy, and no doubt they will advance in their studies quite as much as if they daily went to the, went to the city to school. That sounds like every teacher on the first day of, of the school year, and then things might change as the year goes along. But um, one thing that we did learn in this research that wasn't realized before was that Minnie Knapp actually never learned to read or write. And we know this because we have only one letter in the collection that's um, signed by her, but it is in Hattie's handwriting. And we have two references that say, I wish that Kitty, or I wish that Minnie could read and write. And another um, instance a little bit later, I will show you where Minnie has something read to her. But there was an attempt at education, and there are quite a few books in the collection that have Minnie's inscription on them. Most of them have to do with religion, um, with singing, um, and a little bit later on, there are two books that are popular fiction. But all of it is, is um, an attempt to raise someone with good morals and to raise someone who is um, going to represent the family well. One of my favorites is that little book up there, the blue one. It is literally about this big, and it's called Dew Drops. And it's given to her by Catherine Bonney's husband, Samuel, who is a minister. Oh, one more thing. One more thing to um, give us some perspective. Hattie writes to Kitty at one point. She's at Miss Graham's school, and she's reporting home to her older cousin how she's doing. And Hattie reprimands her, and she says, your letter sounded so like Minnie that I had to scream. So some of the notes that we have from Emily Rankin implies that Minnie might have had an intellectual disability. There's really no way for us to know if this is true or to what degree. She could have had a minor um, disability that made it difficult for her to learn to read. And again, we have to ask ourselves, what would be the priority? If it proves difficult, you're probably not going to try because 
the goal is for many to work in the house as a servant. So we have this little soliloquy um, by Mrs. Gould, and it's actually written by Catherine Bonney, and it's a poem that she sent to Cherry Hill, and it shows Minnie's role in the household as far as the family's view. The doorbell rings, Minnie, what is there? And Minnie's expected to go retrieve the door. We have um, lots of letters in the collection that reference Minnie's taking the mail, Minnie's going to the post office, Minnie is chaperoning different family members. So she is fulfilling that role as a family servant, um, as a female servant in this household. We also know that she was raised to be a cook. Uh, there are a lot of references to Minnie cooking. Uh, on one Thanksgiving where Hattie is home alone, the rest of the family has gone away, she marvels at how Minnie has cooked the turkey beautifully or lovely. This is not one, a small task in a household that has a dozen people or less in it um, and that entertains quite a bit. This is Im these are images of Harriet Mariah or Hat Elmendorf's recipe book, the receipt book. Um, from, it starts in 1839 and it dates all the way to the 1880s. You can see from her indexes, I put the first and last page, there are more than 90 pages in this receipt book. So there are quite a few things that Minnie, is expect, Minnie would be expected to learn. And keep in mind, if she's not able to read, she needs to memorize and learn these recipes. Now, let's put some of this education into context. Minnie's brother, James Knapp, is raised just up the street on State Street, and he has quite a different education. Neither of these children were sent to the Wilberforce School, which we know that you know, if someone was interested in having them properly educated, they could have been sent to the School for African American Children, which is in the South End. Um, but James was educated at home, and he was educated at Sabbath School. And we know that Minnie also attended church, the first Dutch Reformed Church with the Van Rensselaer family descendants. So James had, we have several writing books in the collection um, where he's practicing his penmanship. He has lots of books that are mostly hand-me-downs that are um, popular fiction, nonfiction, picture books, lots of different things like that. And then he was raised to also have an appreciation for music. He played the violin, the piano, and the flute, possibly the banjo and the guitar. So James um, is fairly well-rounded. He um, we have on the right a book that has the beginnings of several songs, and we believe that he was playing, performing music, um, especially after 1880 when Richard Van Rensselaer, who was his guardian and employer, dies, and he's no longer living at State Street and working as their butler. He has a career in music. He's likely playing in parlors. We haven't found any evidence that he's playing in music halls, um, but this book shows evidence that you know, he's performing songs for other people. Um, in the middle, he was also a piano tuner. He has access to people's parlors. He's going in and, and fixing other people's pianos. And then on the left, we have several maps in the collection, or atlases. And in 1880, he actually inherits quite a bit of money, and he travels on his own. He travels to Philadelphia, and he travels to Elmira to visit the siblings. This is access that Minnie does not have. Minnie does not have the ability to travel on her own. Um, by contrast, what is the expectation for women? It's not to be going out and exploring the world as, as Jimmy is or as James is. It's to represent the home, represent femininity, uh, motherhood. And I've, we found this quote. It says, going to the party. It's something that Kitty wrote about getting ready. Such bustle and trying on, such altering and seams to be taken in and let out and gloves to be changed and pins, earrings and bracelets to be mended. It seemed as if they never would get ready for that wonderful party. But at length, the eventful evening arrives and you're arrayed in your very best. Um, and so this is a preoccupation of women and Jocelyn will be telling us a little bit more about that. It takes a lot to present yourself in the Gilded Age. And earlier than that too, the 1860s, this, this costume affair is a big deal. Uh, you can see a lot of details on the dresses, and we have lots of receipts that show that they were buying sashes, and they were buying um, ribbons and buttons, and they were constantly updating their clothing. It's a major preoccupation. So in the middle, we have a receipt for um, fringes and ladies' dress trimmings, cords. I probably should have <laughs> made a little uh, footnote so I can read that. 
Um, but it's a store where you go and you buy the trimmings for your clothing. And on the left, you can see there's this um, jacket that has been altered. On the right, you can see there are these trimmings on, on clothing. They would have taken something and remade it and added something new to update it for the season. Minnie, it appears, is also dressed to impress. So we look at mainly our, um, our photographs of Minnie, our tin types, and we can learn a lot about how she's presenting herself and how she's um, being empowered to present herself. So on the left, we have this dress from the 1860s. Um, it's got some intricate, oop, I forgot I'm wearing this. It has some intricate uh, details here. It has a brooch, she's wearing large earrings. She's probably wearing a snood, and you can see in the picture on the right what a snood would look like. One of the things that we'll talk with Jocelyn a little bit about too when she comes up to show the gown that she's wearing, um, a servant would not necessarily want to have to have a whole bunch of people come and help her get dressed, right? And Brittany and um, Robin and Connie have helped us understand this too. Their job is to help the other women get dressed. So you wouldn't then say, okay, now zip me up. So a lot of the clothes that they have, and especially their hair, it would be something that they could do themselves. Also keeping in mind, this is not a large household with lots of servants. Minnie wouldn't have had a lot of people to rely on to help her get dressed. Um, this is really kind of a fascinating thing that we've just come up with in the past couple of weeks. Um, we have a gown in, or a, a dress in the collection that it is, we assumed was Hattie's. Hattie Elmendorf was very fashionable, and this is a very fashionable dress. So much so that it would be out of fashion next year, right? This is really intended to be worn once and then maybe altered to be able to be worn again. When uh, it was being measured to go on a mannequin for our costume tour, it was discovered that it was way too big for Hattie and also too big for Kitty. And it's too fashionable to have been Harriet Mariah. She would not have worn something that a young woman would have worn at this time. The measurements imply that it could have been something that fit Minnie. And when we asked our experts, they said that is possible. Not probable, but possible. And one of our pieces of evidence is this picture of uh, Minnie from the 1870s. Her dress has a sheen. It doesn't look like it's wool. She's got um, velvet trim, what looks like velvet trim on the sleeves. She has, again, some intricate things going on here. She's dressed up. And so one of the conclusions that we have come to, possibly, here is the gown on, um, I keep saying gown and I don't know if that's appropriate, <laughs> uh, but here is the dress on a mannequin at Cherry Hill right now. Um, you can see that this dress was in the process of being altered and what we think is plausible is that another Van Rensselaer family member or friend uh, said this dress is, I'm done with this dress, would you like this hand-me-down? Maybe it will fit Minnie. And then it was maybe brought to the house and determined it might be a little too small for Minnie. So that would also explain why this dress appears not to have ever been worn. If you look at a lot of the dresses from the time period, there's wear on it. There doesn't appear to be any wear on this. Now we have another piece of evidence of Minnie um, dressing well. Uh, I'm going to give credit to Brittany for colorizing this picture because it really brings it to life. Here's a picture of Minnie a little bit later in the 1880s. Um, and it's a dress that would imply that she's ready to go traveling or she's ready to go out, right? You can see um, she's got a purse on her. She looks like she's ready to go. Um, I'm not going to say too much more about it because I'm going to invite Jocelyn to come up now and model for us because Brittany has recreated the dress from the picture so that we can see what it would actually look like. And you can see it has the bustle in the back, uh, which I recently learned would, would date it to later in the Gilded Age, um, or middle of the Gilded Age. Uh, it's not a hoop skirt. Uh, we were wondering what um, is the, the bow and what is holding Minnie's hair or what's on her head. And this is what Brittany thought, is that it's probably a bow for a bonnet, which would make sense if she's going out. Jocelyn, would you tell us what the experience was like being fitted for the dress and also wearing it? Um, oh, let me grab your microphone. So this dress is... Um, warm. <laughs> it is wool. <laughs> it has um, many layers. Um, 
and <laughs> uh, it is wool. Um, it has a corset. So at that time, uh, women wore corsets. Uh, so what you mentioned about Minnie uh, maybe not having someone to dress her, I, I, I'm still wondering about that because there is no way with uh, a corset to someone to tie it by, um, by themselves. Uh, when I rem uh, at the fitting, the last fitting, when I took everything off, when we took every when Brittany helped me take things off, it I it was um, I kind of felt like my whole body just went like I can't do it now because of the corset, but the whole body dropped. Um, what Brittany um, told me was that the different. With the corset, it, it it engages different muscles that we don't we no longer need those not need but we don't use those muscles anymore because we don't wear a corset. So uh, as soon as I removed the corset, my whole body dropped. Uh, it is not uncomfortable uh, to be to stand nice and straight. It's actually quite comfortable. Uh, I I probably will drop as soon as I take I remove everything. Um, what else did we talk about earlier? Um, many layers. Oh, yeah, uh, the yeah. heating. Uh, Brittany reminded me that they had wool clothes and they had layers because there wasn't any indoor heating in, in people's homes. So th the clothing was part of uh, keeping warm. Uh, I don't know what else. How many layers of skirts are you wearing? So uh, there is an undergarment that looks like kind of a uh, like a nightgown, uh, it comes down to here, and then the corset comes on top. There wasn't real underwear, uh, so women didn't have to wear um, brassieres, which now we do, and it's awful. <laughs> um, it's, it's actually quite nice to not have to do that. Um, and then there's another, uh, there's another slip Brittany, what's the right word for that? A petticoat. So there's one petticoat under the underwear, it's called, and then, um, and then there's another petticoat, and then there's the skirt, and then there's uh, this, this uh, uh, jacket. Um, so, and this is uh, wool, and the, and the top is wool as well. Um, and they used to use a lot of velvet to, just make everything look so prettier and richer. Is that the word? Um, so um, I think that's great. Thank you very much, Jocelyn. So one of the things that Jocelyn um, mentioned is that her corset is not too tight. And that's something that someone pointed out um, in this in this picture of Minnie. Her corset is not too tight. And maybe that's part of the, the idea that, you know, she doesn't maybe need as much help to get dressed because they're not having her, you know, to suck everything in. But the idea is that she has to work. Obviously, she wouldn't be wear working in this, but she would still be expecting to help the women and help people as they're going about their day, even when she is dressed up. Um, and one more thing about this outfit is that we're expecting that Minnie might be traveling soon or hitting the road. And the reason for that is because it's dated to about the 1880s. And Cherry Hill, if you know the story that we tell, uh, is about to pass out of their hands. The Elmendorf family has really fallen on hard times. Peter Elmendorf has passed away a few years earlier. And Kitty says, our dear old home is about to pass out of our hands. It has been a terrible blow to us and nearly killed us. It's hard to think of strangers being in these well-loved rooms and no Cherry Hill ever to come back to anymore. Now, Kitty has a savior in the um, way of Edward Rankin, who's someone that she's been dating uh, for some time. And he writes to his father saying that he's, at this moment, he's decided to propose to her once he's discovered that this has happened to the family. And he says, she has done a foolish act, or many of them, in a worldly point of view. And I do not think that she realizes she's been swept clean of everything she has. What is the foolish act? Well, Kitty came to Cherry Hill with an inheritance. She came with some money from her mother, but she also came with items that 
Um, her mother had inherited from Philip Van Rensselaer. We know from this inventory that Harriet Mariah and Kitty's father, Alonzo Putman, put together in 1861 that it includes quite a few things that date back to Philip Van Rensselaer. The foolish act is that she gave all of these things away to Aunt Hat in the way that she's supporting her and you know you would give to your guardian and a lot of these things actually were sold or sent away um, and the money was no longer there. So she is literally destitute. Maybe not literally, but she's destitute. Now what about Minnie, right? In this situation, if Kitty's in this situation, Minnie hasn't been out courting as Kitty has been. She hasn't been groomed to be someone's wife. Um, but Kitty did actually have some, something of what might be considered an inheritance. And we have this one thing in the collection that is always so puzzling. It's a bank book that Peter Elmendorf took out for Minnie, it says for uh, Harriet Knapp. And in 18, I'm forgetting now what date it is, 1858, so not long after she comes to Cherry Hill, and it has $1 in it. And this is all we know of this. We do know that Minnie was likely not paid. There's no record that any of the child servants were paid at Cherry Hill. So it's not like Minnie has savings. And we also know that she could have had an inheritance because her mother, Jane Jackson Knapp, had a bank book. Um, and when uh, she dies, it's entrusted to Richard Van Rensselaer, who's raising James Knapp, and he doesn't give it to anyone. And he's also the... Um, on the board at the Albany Savings Bank where the, the bank book has been taken out. Um, and it's only until his death that they realize that their mother had this bank book. And we have lots of letters in the collection between Richard and James where Richard is saying, you know, so nice of him to have saved this bank book for us. And then, but wait a minute, we weren't, he was, she wasn't given the correct interest. And there's a lot of back and forth this is an excerpt of the letter, or a copy of the letter that Richard sends to the gentleman, uh, at the board of the Albany Savings Bank. And it doesn't appear that they were ever granted the interest, but what it might show, the letters, is that James actually got the inheritance himself. And we have on the far right, uh, James becomes, um, basically, it, he comes into control of his mother's estate in 1861 around this, or 1881, around the same time that there are all these letters circulating of James, you know, send me, send me the information, I will manage it, I will make sure that our sisters get their share. Um, in the middle we have, uh, on the bottom we have a receipt, or I'm sorry, an obituary from Richard Van Rensselaer uh, when he died in 1880, and it shows that James had already inherited $500, which by today's accounts I looked up was about 13,000. It's quite a bit of money. Um, and what they're talking about in this bank book is about $52 that's going to be split four ways. I don't know. We'll have to keep trying to dig through the documents and see what else we can find. But it appears that nothing was given to many. And there's a letter on the left after James dies of tuberculosis in 1885. And it appears that the Van Rensselaer household, the Cherry Hill household, kept all of James's things because he does live at Cherry Hill after um, he leaves State Street after Richard Van Rensselaer dies. And according to um, the letter on the left, Richard is advocating for his sister Jane. He says, I've received two letters from my sister. She's very much dissatisfied over Mrs. Elmendorf's not letting her sister Minnie come to James's funeral. Um, I'll explain why in a moment. And about her wanting all of James's best things. And she knows that there was money in the bank and what has happened to it. So what happens is at Cherry Hill, the Elmendorfs leave once they realize that they cannot afford to keep the house anymore. And they move to New Jersey where Hattie's husband lives and is from. And Kitty, who has had her um, boyfriend propose to her, he has arranged for them to rent at Cherry Hill so she can stay. And the question that one of her friends brings up is what's to become of Minnie? And the letters that we have, we have lots of letters talking about this back and forth. And there is a duty that Harriet Mariah feels to Minnie. And she actually says, um, at one point, John Gould, Hattie's husband, doesn't even want Harriet Mariah to come with them to New Jersey. He's going to cast off his mother-in-law. He doesn't really get away with that, um, although he's really not too happy about her pet bird or about Minnie. And in letters, we, talk, we see that he, um, Hattie advocates for her. And one of the things that really stood out was, I do not feel I could cast the poor faithful thing off. 
She's been with our family since she's a young girl. She's been faithful to us. Um, and she, in her letters that she sends to Hattie and also letters that Hattie sends to Kitty later, they advocate for Minnie in that she's, she serves us. She's devoted to us. And that, you know, uh, she will then feel all the better for doing all she could have done to make you happy. That is the role that they see that Minnie fulfills. But she's still vulnerable because once they move to New Jersey, they struggle financially for the rest of their lives. And there are several letters in the collection with Hattie writing to Kitty, asking her to take Minnie. Take Minnie for this period of time. Uh, you know, she would be an asset to you. Uh, she also at one point says that her mother's going to take her to um, family members in Scotia and Glen. Um, and, you know, she, she won't be a burden. She'll be, you know, she'll be helpful. Uh, at one point in 1901, after the death of Harriet Mariah, Hattie does write to Kitty and she asks to see if she can get a place for Minnie in the, the home of the friendless in Albany. We actually have a volunteer at Cherry Hill whose father was um, sent to the home of the friendless as a child. Um, and the idea is, you know, this is where someone could go if they don't have the means to support themselves. So Minnie was almost in that position of not being supported. We know that that never happened and she was back and forth with Cherry Hill quite a bit. Whenever Hattie could not keep her at her house in New Jersey, she sent her to Cherry Hill. And ironically, the same person who becomes Kitty's savior in buying, eventually boarding and then buying Cherry Hill back is the person who ends up helping Minnie out. To the left is a picture of um, Kitty on her wedding day or in her wedding dress. And here is Edward Rankin on the right. So when Kitty or when Minnie is at Cherry Hill, this is another piece of evidence that shows us that she could not read or write. Uh, she receives a letter, Catherine's away. It's just Edward and Minnie and some other household servants who they, they eventually have in the late 1880s. And Minnie receives a letter and she asks Edward to read it. Turns out it was Minnie's birthday a couple days ago and Edward did not know, but her, her ma remembered and Hattie remembered and sent her birthday wishes. And we see that as time goes on, Minnie becomes very close with the Rankin family and she becomes uh, very affectionate with the Rankin's children. So um, Kitty and Edward's children, she sends them cards or gifts like this. It says on the back, for the three children with Minnie's love, Minnie's best Christmas wishes, Christmas 1902. And on the bottom it says, supposed to represent Eddie, Herbert and Emily the three children. So Minnie sees this and thinks of them. And she talks a lot about the children. Hattie will write and say, Minnie will not stop talking about your kids that she was just visiting and helping take care of. Now, it brings me back to Minnie's role in the house and how she identified, because the title of this talk, which I promise is almost over, is called Agency and Identity. And how did Minnie identify not knowing, um, not knowing how she, she, we don't have a diary, we don't have her letters. And in this one, we do have an overheard conversation of Minnie talking. So I'll read this. It's from 1875, so it's before all of the fallout. I really must say that Minnie is doing beautifully. This is Kitty writing to Hattie, Kitty's home alone uh, with Minnie and Mary. It's very amusing to hear the dialogues between Minnie and Mary. I stand at the dinning door, so the probably the um, dumbwaiter, and listen to them until I think I shall bust. Mary said, Minnie, Miss Hattie belongs to me, and Miss Kitty belongs to you. And Minnie said, Miss Kitty belongs to us all. And when we think about this sense of belonging, Minnie really, um, she doesn't identify as a family member in every way. Certainly after you see that Aunt Hat has passed away or that Harry Mariah has passed away, Hattie goes back and forth between, you know, Kitty, or Minnie has constant um, health issues. As she gets older, she injures herself and she doesn't tell anyone. She needs to have surgery. Um, Hattie writes about the hardship that she continues to have. Certainly she um, feels some affinity to Minnie, but a lot of it has to do with her mother. And a lot of Minnie's identity is really as a daughter. It's not necessarily as anything else to other members in the household. She is so connected to Harriet Mariah. When Minnie dies in 1903, 
Hattie writes, and the letter is like smudged up. It's a difficult letter to write, to read because Hattie obviously was having difficulty writing it. But she says, and now all seems to have been done just as Ma would have wished and poor Minnie too. And I'm glad to think of her at rest near those she loves so well. This is an image, the blurry one, sorry, of the Van Rensselaer plot at Albany Rural Cemetery. So the big Van Rensselaer plot. Peter Almendorf is on the left, Harriet Mariah Almendorf is on the right, and we know from um, records, thanks to Paula Lemire, is that uh, Minnie is buried behind the tomb. She's the only person who was a servant buried in the Van Rensselaer plot that we know of. Now, back to Kitty. How did Kitty identify, and what is her agency as she goes through this, these troubles? She identifies as a Van Rensselaer, and something I forgot to mention that Deborah had just told me today, in that image of um, Kitty all dressed up in the 1870s, where she, her hair's up and she's got the bustled dress, she's actually wearing a brooch, or a, um, a, miniature a miniature portrait of her ancestor, Robert Sanders Van Rensselaer, on, um, right where a brooch would be. Uh, she's identifying as a Van Rensselaer. And of course, she inherits Cherry Hill, or she doesn't inherit Cherry Hill, her husband buys Cherry Hill. And she starts buying back all the furniture that her family members had sold or taken with them to New Jersey. And remember those pieces that are listed in the inventory that were traced back to Philip Van Rensselaer? There's her chair, there's the mirror, there's the, the base. And of course, it's still there today. On the left, you can see it, her inheritance. And I just stumbled across this picture, but I figured that it was a good one to end with for Kitty because um, she could have been in a very different position if she had not had been a part of the social class that she was a part of and if she had not had the grooming that she had had. Um, she identifies as a Van Rensselaer and in the end that ended up being something that really saves her when her family becomes destitute because she has the composure, she has the refinement of someone that someone would want to marry, as, as the feminist in me cringes as I say that. Um, but, and she really enjoyed her life, clearly. Here's my bibliography, which is quite a bit messy, so I'm just going to go through. Uh, if anyone is interested in any of my sources, I will share them with you. Um, we had a combination of different items. I'll say that our consultants were really valuable, and also uh, the Kitty Putman teaching unit that my predecessor, Rebecca Watrous, created back in the early 90s um, is chock full of wonderful information. So if any teachers out there would like to go back to paper teaching units, I, I can help you with that. Um, I just want to invite you to come back to Cherry Hill um, to join in on our other uh, offerings. We have um, some tours coming up, as Deborah mentioned, um, and we will also be live streaming uh, the uh, talk by Dr. Christopher Brellix. Um, and his performance on YouTube. And this, I know, will be uh, uploaded to YouTube, too. Um, any teachers who are in the audience, if you would like CTLE credit, there is a clipboard for you to record that down so that you can have credit. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can also uh, get credit from watching it. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I went over time. Does anyone have any questions? If you'd like, you can come up and talk to me later. Oh, yes. Is Minnie's um, gravesite marked? It is not. That's a good question. So we actually had a, a tour with Paula Lemire to find it. But from what she, from the records, it's directly behind. I'll linger too if you want to come up afterwards. Uh, we do have a table set up with some um, education props, a stereograph if you'd like to, or a stereoscope if you'd like to look. Um, and also pictures of some of the people that I showed you. And if you'd like to get a closer look at the recreation of Minnie's dress, I think Jocelyn would be around for a little bit. Yeah, please give a, a round of applause for Jocelyn for sitting in that, because I'm hot, so I can't imagine. Yeah.